Good afternoon and welcome to the broadcast from Santa Monica, California. Today's presentation is on L1A visas and uh, we're specifically talking about executives and managers. Thank you all for joining today's broadcast. As a reminder, uh, this presentation, like others in this series, will be shorter than usual and it will cover the main and most salient points of the visa category. This presentation is not uh, direct legal advice and it is for information purposes only. If you have any questions during the broadcast, please feel free to type them in and I will address them at the end or as it comes up during the presentation. And of course, if I don't get to your question, please feel free to email me directly afterwards and we can go from there. My name, by the way, is Joseph Shepard, and I'm a senior associate here at the firm, and I'll be walking you through some of these points. So what is an L1A? Well, an L1A is for executives or managers. The key elements are that there is one year of full-time employment in the aggregate abroad with a qualifying corporate entity within the three years directly preceding the filing of an individual L1A petition in a capacity that was managerial, executive, or involving specialized knowledge. The key here, though, is that the U.S. position will be either managerial or executive in nature, and that person will be coming to the U.S. to render the services to a related entity. So I put qualifying in quotation marks for a reason, because there are several different ways that entities can qualify as qualifying entities. So first we have parent and subsidiary. So if you have people that you want to transfer over from a branch, a subsidiary or affiliate, or even a parent company, that is possible here. This slide outlines the various relationships. It doesn't matter for purposes of L1A what type of relationship there is it matters more that there is a relationship. So for large and established companies, this won't be a problem. You know, showing the joint ownership, sometimes if they have the blanket, already the L1Z, which will be a different presentation, um, they'll be able to transfer folks over with a little bit more ease. But what is key is if you have a managerial or executive position in the US that you want to fill temporarily with a person from a corporate affiliate, subsidiary branch or parent abroad, you may be able to do so if they have at least one year of qualifying employment with one of these types of qualifying corporate entities abroad. Their qualifying employment abroad does not necessarily have to be executive or managerial. It could also be specialized knowledge in nature. The key for L1A designation is that the position in the US is managerial or executive. For a entity abroad to be considered a qualifying corporate entity, they have to be, or they have to have the relationship at the time the two companies have to have that qualifying corporate relationship at the time the, the petition is filed. It does not need to exist for the full duration of the person's employment abroad. So the person has to be employed abroad for one year in the aggregate within the past three in a qualifying capacity with that entity, that entity did not have to be related to the US company for that entire period, just at the time the petition is filed. So if you acquire a company abroad and want to transfer some folks to the US from that newly acquired company, the relationship exists now. So the, the next step is to determine whether or not they have a qualifying position abroad and that they'll be coming to the US to fill either an executive or managerial position. There is a key though that there's at least one qualifying corporate entity abroad for the duration of the person's L1 employment in the US. It does not have to be the same entity from which they transferred. There is an exception, however, for a subset of L1 visas called the, uh, the new office L1s, where that specific foreign entity abroad must remain in existence 
throughout the initial year and during the pendency of any L1 extension that you file. That first year is that one year of L1A status in the US. An L1A new office is possible, for example, for companies that seek to expand into the US by opening up a new branch, subsidiary, parent or affiliate in the US and you want to have someone come to the US to set it all up. There are slightly different rules in the L1A new office context than in the L1 context in general, like you can see with this one exception, which will be an entirely another presentation since we are just doing a short overview today of the categories. What I want to focus on with this presentation is really what are the what does it mean by managerial or executive? And I think that is a very important distinction because a lot of folks would like to transfer people to the US for various rotations or various periods, but perhaps they're either the US position itself does not qualify as managerial or executive, or the, their qualifying employment abroad is not managerial, executive, or specialized in capacity. So we're gonna go through the, you know, a little bit more into the specifics of what would qualify. So the distinction between um, uh, the manager in the traditional sense of supervisor, it, it's not the same thing. A first line supervisor alone does not qualify as a manager in this context. So bear that in mind. The person would have to really be responsible for the direction of the activities of the business or department, division, unit, team, or a central function through subordinate managers, subordinate professionals, and or specialists. Um, those subordinates carry out the you know, activities that the manager is overseeing and implementing and perhaps even developing um, the ability of a person to be a quote unquote manager for L1 purposes necessarily requires these levels of subordinate um, individuals in order to relieve them of performing non-managerial tasks. So, for example, if someone was going to be primarily doing the project, doing the actual physical work on a project in the U.S., a majority of their time and also was going to be managing that project um, you know on the broader sense maybe of reporting purposes or something like that that would not necessarily qualify as managerial there is something called a functional manager which we'll get into just a little bit later where the subordinates are not as important if you can show that the essential function they are managing is actually an essential component or part of the business operations. Without them doing that role, it would not be a successful business enterprise or endeavor. The executive is a little bit broader, and we'll get into that in just a second. Um, I think that, you know, from a managerial perspective, whenever framing the person's position abroad, and the potential p position in the US, you do really want to focus on the org charts of the personnel below them who are helping to carry out their direction. Uh, I can't emphasize this enough as you'll see in the slides to come. Org charts, org charts, org charts are incredibly important. Um, when a beneficiary, and that's the person that who's, go who's going to be transferred, will be, um, oh, excuse me, actually, w whenever the person who's going to be carrying out these duties in the US, let's say, um, if they're going to be supervising folks who are already hired by the US company, that's important to note as well. USCIS requires you to show that it's more likely than not true that the person will be in a managerial role and what can be helpful to show that it is in a managerial role is having people already on staff who will be able to relieve them from performing non-managerial duties at least more than 50% of the time. Some examples of you know 
language that is exemplary of a managerial position as far as job duties are concerned can be something along the lines of you know, directed, oversaw, and led the overall business expansion of the company's brand, including all international expansion activities, uh, developed the marketing or sales strategies for the company's entire global expansion or expansion into a specific uh, country or segment, um, overseeing the implementation of the international strategic expansion uh, plan. You know, maybe they didn't develop it, but they're overseeing it and carrying it out through directing and managing a team of subordinate professionals and, and managers. Um, having just subordinate administrative um, individuals is not sufficient. They would have to be really professional, and professional in this sense for USCIS, the most easy way to demonstrate that is with uh, their credentials, showing that they actually are degreed professionals or are actually certified technical specialists in whatever they're doing or um, you know, demonstrating the, the, sub, the credentials of the subordinate managers who are then, you know, overseeing the staff that would be carrying out the more, you know, lower level functions or actual hands-on productive work. For an executive, it's similar to the manager, but it's broader in scale. Uh, it's really justified by the company's size, structure, and nature of the products or services. One common misconception that we often see, for, for example, for individuals who maybe tried on their own or filed on their own for an L1A executive uh, as opposed to an L1A manager, perhaps their title includes the word executive in it, so they figured, well, executive should be it, or maybe they're a very small company or they're opening up a small office um, or just running a, a not yet fully grown office. Um, if they want to say that they are an executive, well, that'll be harder to do than manager because of the, the need to show this very broad, you know, company or, you know, managerial goals and policies um, as opposed to the directing and managing the subordinates who are going to be carrying it out, um, you know, maybe developing some part of it, but not necessarily the entire overall um, you know, plan of the, the company. Important to note, just as an aside, for L1A managers or executives, they're, like I said before, they can have that qualifying employment abroad if it's in a specialized knowledge capacity. They could still come to the US and be L1A if the US position is managerial or executive. So it's important to note that someone who is a you know, specialized knowledge individual abroad can still qualify for an L1A manager executive. Um, so to be able to spot those kinds of things when, for example, if you're an HR ind individual and you receive you know, from a hiring manager the resume of someone from a, a affiliate abroad, you take a look at it and, oh, well, this doesn't look like they were a manager abroad, so they may not qualify. Well, that's not necessarily true. If they, you know, had a special or advanced knowledge of the, you know, either product or service or the company's internal processes or procedures to a very high degree, um, you know, that employment can still qualify for purposes of intercompany transferees under the L1 program. So understanding L1A within the context of the entire L1 overview is important and being able to spot employment abroad that qualifies under any of the three categories um, is important. Nonetheless, what do you do, what, what documents are needed and what are the kinds of considerations or things that you should start asking for in the event you yourself want to transfer or you have an employee who, who you seek to transfer either through a petition or um, a blanket based application? Well, I would say number one, get prepared to do some arts and crafts. Org charts, org charts, org charts. These are, you know, I can't emphasize this enough, not only for, to de demonstrate the qualifying corporate relationship between the entity in the US and the entity from where the person will be transferred, um, and showing all of the, you know, the international scope of the business, um, you know, I would say, you know, 
it, it, with as much detail as possible, you know, line and block. And then also on the personnel side, from the, the person's position abroad and the intended position in the US. You want to be able to show all these levels and com organizational complexity. Um, you want to be able to show that if they're a manager, they have sufficient subordinate managers, professionals, specialists, etc., who will be carrying on the, you know, the actual um, work that they're directing and managing, overseeing. Um, in addition to that, it's it's important these days with the level of scrutiny USCIS will give to these petitions to include evidence of everyone's names, positions, titles. Um, like I said, also their credentials. This all doesn't have to go into the org chart. It can be accompanied behind the org chart or with the org chart, you know, either in an Excel spreadsheet um, as subsequent exhibits. Um, but you want to be able to demonstrate and show that these these uh, subordinates are in fact themselves either managerial or professional. Um, pay records. Often we receive requests for evidence for the pay records from abroad of all these subordinate managers. They're not going to just take your word for it on the org chart, but they want to see the org chart nonetheless, um, perhaps because who knows, they are visual learners, but uh, it does summarize very n nicely and, and concisely for the officer and will help the, the likelihood of the case being approved uh, to include all of these things. Um, for the person themselves to demonstrate their employment abroad, pay records and stubs for at least the 365 days in the aggregate that they have this qualifying employment abroad, if not more, um, you know, the equivalent of W-2s. Employment verification letters are uh, essential because for some companies that don't have internal uh, job descriptions or do have internal job descriptions that are more generic in nature and don't really demonstrate the, the complexity or the um, level of detail required in, in, in this purpose, employment verification letters, reiterating those and expanding upon those to a very high degree confirming that the person, you know, from X date to X date, they held this position overseeing and directing the entire logistics and sales strategies for our Asia department. Um, the, another key thing to, to consider is for managers, it's very helpful if that person had any budgeting or physical responsibility to document that. If they were an individual who was responsible for signing off on the annual report or quarterly report, not necessarily um, for the, the company overall, but maybe for their segment or division, if they made any presentations to that effect. If they did have signing authority, great. Include all these types of documents um, in the employment verification letter or with the employment verification letter. Um, and, and of course, to the extent there are marketing materials in existence for the company in English that are <laughs> easily providable, um, but it all, if there's an annual report, if there's an investor presentation, if there are um, not these types of things, it would be behoove the petitioner to include a very detailed business plan, especially for smaller or newer companies. In an L1 new office context, when someone's coming to the U.S. to open up a subsidiary parent branch uh, affiliate of a business abroad, the business plan is as an absolute requirement. I believe and 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 you know use that strategy as well in L1A's individual petitions you know not just for new office I believe it's important to show and really to 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 put it into story format for the officer you know this is what the business is this is what it does this is where we have offices presences sales etc this is where we're going this is why we're growing and it also then adds context and backstory which is often overlooked in this category for the officer to really grab hold of and have that be in the back of their mind oh the reason for the transfer is you know as pursuant to our our global expansion program or pursuant to our um, you know X Y or Z our goals this 
you know, this person is coming to the U.S. to carry them out. And, you know, for example, here's a copy of the, the plan that they're coming to carry out. Um, those types of things. Um, you know, websites are great, too, if that's, if that's all you have. But it, it's not as simple as the H-1B context where the About Us section of the website can be sufficient for information about the, uh, the, the company. You really want to go into the weeds on not just the qu qualifying corporate relationship, but also what are they doing? What is this business? What are their plans? Um, especially um, for smaller companies. I can't emphasize that enough. There is a lot of scrutiny given to smaller companies in L1A. As, you know, I would say L1A managers versus L1A executives overall, just because that is more likely um, you know, the, the correct, qual the, the correct uh, designation, but of course every case is different. Um, and for functional managers, I do want to also get into just slightly. Um, if individuals are coming into the U.S. Um, and either the U.S. position does not have subordinates or it has very few subordinates and, um, and or the position abroad didn't have many, but the person really was responsible for developing and directing a, a you know, very specific um, and crucial part of the business, that may qualify for functional. Um, you know, we don't, functional is not a term that is, you know, put onto an application per se. It is, is the way that you demonstrate managerial capacity without, um, you know, without those, those subordinate managers or, or professionals. Um, functional managers, it, it would be very important to demonstrate, you know, in line with what I just mentioned about the the business plan or the, you know, the goals or objectives of the company or the reason behind the transfer. Perhaps this person is the implementation manager for the project and uh, the position, in, maybe they had specialized knowledge assignment ab abroad where they were one of, say, several engineers or technic, you know, technical folks who um, were implementing these things and were planning on implementing them around the world. And the one that's going to the U.S. is coming to the U.S. to actually implement this new stage of, of the project or, or develop it further. That person may qualify as a manager and under the, a functional manager uh, category. And, you know, in line with that, it would be wise to include very detailed descriptions of the purpose of the transfer behind it. Uh, and, and for all of these um, types of situations or scenarios for executives and managers, you also need to demonstrate the qualifications of the person. Um, you know, it's, it's wise to include any degrees or diplomas. Um, you know, it's, it's not an absolute necessity, but you know, they're, beyond just their CV or resume, um, it might be wise to include any awards, presentations, or even articles about them if they are of an executive level, perhaps that exists. You know, the, these are all considerations to, to think about for L1As, but and the functional manager is one of the trickiest subsets, um, not so much as L1B, which is also another segment uh, or another presentation, but keep that in mind. Now, on the, on the flip side, on the U.S., what do you need to show that a position qualifies as managerial or executive. Well, you're not going to have pay stubs, but you, and you're not going to have an employment verification letter because they haven't started working there yet. But perhaps consider this. Think about this in, in the broader context. Who's doing that in the U.S. now? Is anyone? If they are, talk about it. Demonstrate it. You know, we had, we previously had someone in this role, and we haven't for a year. We have someone in a very similar managerial position in our Canadian office and we would like to transfer them here temporarily to fulfill this role and carry it out. Um, that is, that that can be helpful. Maybe include the person's prior, um, the prior person's um, position or something like that. On the org chart for someone who's coming to the U.S., you would still designate all the names, titles, and positions of everyone at the U.S. office or U.S. company and, and designate or include, you know, the beneficiary as a potential very soon to be addition, you know, upon approval of the petition in that org chart, you know, designate that as and highlight that as that their, you know, upcoming role. 
often then USCIS will want to see pay records of everybody else who's below them or that, that, that they'll be managing or watching. Um, this is not necessary in every single position, or excuse me, every single petition, especially for larger companies and established companies that USCIS is familiar with and have seen lots of petitions from. But from the smaller companies or newer companies, this is important, especially for companies that are very, growing very quickly. You know, perhaps even six within a six-month period, added 30 new employees. Um, that would be important to discuss and demonstrate. I do have a question here for a person. Let's see. The question is for a situation where a beneficiary is working abroad for a company and is getting paid overseas but is physically in the U.S. for most of the time of the year with another type of visa, such as a B-1, is that uh, qualified for to file l one So that's a very good question. The, the question relates to meeting the three, the one it, minimum of one year in the aggregate within the, the previous three years of employment abroad uh, with a qualifying entity. Time spent in the U.S. does not count towards meeting that 365-day full-time continuous employment abroad within the previous three requirement. Uh, time spent in the U.S. Does, does not get to be added to that. So if you have a you know, you know, project manager who came into the U.S. to you know, do some con uh, negotiate some contracts with folks ahead of time, maybe for a month or two months uh, in the U.S., perhaps uh, setting up either um, you know, getting the lease for the new expansion of that of that unit to the US or something similar, that time in the US cannot be used, even though they were paid and employed abroad for that duration, that time cannot be used um, for purposes of demonstrating the one year of qualifying employment abroad. That is a very good question and thank you very much for bringing that up. Um, the, you know, I, I think that the point is you want to be able to demonstrate Overall, and if you work with an immigration attorney to assist with the pr preparation of all of this and gathering of all of this and organizing it and, and summarizing it and showing USCIS why it all qualifies, think about the story. What is the business? What is it doing? Why does it need someone to be transferred? While demonstrating the need behind a transfer is not a requirement uh, for L1A, I do suggest that you include such a presentation. It gives the USCIS officer a little bit more to hold on to and helps them understand the position. If it's if it's too technical or above their head without the, the broader context of what this company does and you know why they're transferring someone here at all, um, it may be harder for that officer to feel comfortable approving the case or not issuing a request for evidence. Um, so that's just something to consider. You want to demonstrate the high-level work of the person that they'll be doing in the U.S. It's much easier to do so if there are already individuals that will be subordinate to them on staff, but it's not a requirement. Um, you know, for very small companies, um, the L1A manager is more likely to um, be realistic than an, an L1A executive, unless really it is the executive of the company who's going to be coming over to do the opening. Um, and I think it's also important, and I, I don't think I touched on this yet, in line with the org charts, just due to the nature of the, the new global you know, workforce and telecommuting and um, you know, working around time zones, it is entirely possible that the person will be you know, still managing or directing even on, on a project basis or not, subordinates around the world or even contractors in the U.S. or around the world. I think that that information is helpful. If they're not on payroll of the company, you know, make sure to demonstrate and document what the, their, you know, their either contractor status is or employment at one of the affiliates or maybe um, related companies abroad. But that that can still be helpful to demonstrate the managerial or executive nature of the of the U.S. assignment. They're going to be still relying on, you know, their team back in the U.K. Um, in addition to the contractors in the U.S., you know, attach please find copies of the 1099s of the ones that we had in the U.S. last year. Um, attach please find, you know, the 
payroll records from the UK entity where all these team members are based. Here's the org chart with just the US entity and team. And here's another org chart with that same info, but zoomed out with you know the contractors and international workers added as well. Now, just to do a little bit of the, the finer points, L1A is a maximum of seven years altogether. For those familiar with the H1B process, uh, it's a six-year maximum. L1A is seven years, and it's granted in the first one is for three years, and then two extensions of two years each. That's important to note, and it's different from the L1B um, because the L1B for specialized knowledge positions in the U.S. has a five-year max of three initially and then a two-year extension. For time spent outside of the U.S., any day over, you know, any trip out of the U.S. for, for 24 or more um, can be recaptured towards the end of that period, similar to the H. So, for example, if someone is, you know, out of the U.S. for an aggregate of three months every year, uh, you can use, you can add up those three-month periods to extend the person's L1A and recapture that time out of the U.S. at the end thus advancing their seven-year aggregate maximum of L1 time. There are exceptions to these, max, uh, these seven- and five-year maximums overall, and that's for individuals who are in the U.S. intermittently. Um, if they're in and out of the U.S., it's basically if they're you know, either you know, out of, not in the U.S. for more than half the time, uh, they may qualify uh, for intermittent L1 which as long as they you know, can demonstrate each time that they're applying for this every two or three years, um, you know, copies of their travel, you know, their either travel history from the CBP website, uh, entry and exit stamps, flight records, et cetera, that can be helpful to show intermittent. And then intermittent extensions can be granted in, in two-year increments uh, indefinitely uh, for as, you know, as long as the person realistically is, is still intermittently working for the company. Another important point and distinction between the L1A and the H1B, uh, which is the, the, the another common U.S. work visa, is that L2 spouses, and this is all L2 spouses, um, are eligible to apply for unrestricted work authorization once they're here in the U.S. The spouse, the L2 spouse, cannot apply for it ahead of time. You have to apply once you're here in the U.S., and it takes about 90 to 120 days at current. Um, before you, you know, the spouse will receive these EADs after arrival in the U.S. The, the nice thing, however, though, is for any L extensions, uh, the L2 spouse can also extend their L2 at the same time that L1 petition is filed to, uh, for the extension, so it can be concurrently filed, which means it can be used with premium processing, and you can concurrently file the EAD renewal application as well, uh, for the L2 spouse, meaning with premium processing, that's 15 calendar days versus 90 to 120 days, the irregular processing. So that's just something nice to keep in mind. Uh, L2 children are not work authorized, and um, but L2 spouses and children will be admitted to the U.S. for the same period of time as the L1. The other important point here is that dual intent is explicitly permitted for L status. That means that the person doesn't have to have a residence abroad. They have no intent of abandoning. Um, they further may also intend to apply for permanent residence or even apply for permanent residence and not be pen penalized or restricted in any way. What this means in practice, for example, is let's say that an L1A um, executive or manager has a green card application, uh, a, a green card petition filed for them for the EB-13 category, which is the green card version of the L for executives and managers only. Um, and there's no premium processing on those. They take seven months or so to pend at minimum. The, they also have an application to adjust status pending at the same time. Uh, for, for folks familiar with other types of, of non-immigrant visas except for the H and L, there is no dual intent permitted, so they cannot travel out of the U.S. while an application to adjust status to green card is pending. If they do so, it will be lost, and they would have to remain outside to uh, you know, start the process again from uh, the consular side of things. 
But for H's and L's, they're allowed to travel freely. They just have to be in the U.S. when the application to adjust status is filed. Um, so that is a, a nice addition built into the H and L programs um, to explicitly permit um, individuals in those categories to eventually become green card holders. Um, the EB-13 or EB-1C, as it's also known, category is just for executive or managers. Um, it is a first preference classification, meaning that it, in most instances and more often and almost always, it's current, um, but there is no premium processing, so they do take a while. Therefore, it's, it's wise and would likely behoove individuals seeking to become permanent residents through the EB-13 program to you know, at least start out in L. Uh, that makes it a little bit, you know, uh, it allows them to start working a lot sooner and um, it's, a, it's a stepping stone built into that program. One last point that I also want to mention too is that, you know, whenever there is someone who is, oh, let me go back to that last one. Whenever there is a new office L1A and, you know, the, the person who is a owner um, or a you know, major stockholder, there's an exception to the dual intent requirement there for them. Um, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, for L1A new office petitions, that entity from which they transferred must be in existence and ongoing throughout the first year. Um, the, the dual intent requirement is slightly different. They still if you're coming in on the new office L1A, you have to demonstrate temporary intent. And that means intent to depart after the assignment is over and will return to the US. Specifically, this was built into place because the L1A new office um, was not designed as a means by which people could just open up a branch subsidiary parent in the US, cl immediately close down their business operations in the foreign company and continue onward. Um, they're, they're very stricter rules in that regard, and they don't um, explicitly permit that dual intent for, for those individuals only. Um, if there are any questions, um, please email me directly. My email address is jsheperd at wolfsdorf.com. You could also contact us through the website. Thanks, and have a great day.